What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the Quarantine Zone again, and this time we are here with Kevin of Chemical Straight Jacket. Thank you so much for your time today. It's great to have you here. Uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. I wouldn't miss it for the world. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. So right now we have the new uh, single Texas out. That's the latest like new offering that we got from Chemical Straight Jacket. Is this maybe like a good representation of what the follow up to Wretched Things will sound like? Or is that just the tip of the iceberg, as I like to say? Um, well, um, Dark Progression, the next album, which Texas is the single from, is massive. It's uh, 14 new songs and then three bonus tracks. Um, I would say that Texas is a good representation, but you're also gonna get a lot more than that. There's some moody stuff, there's some dark, creepy stuff, um, but I, I would definitely say that Texas is the overarching vibe of the album. It's, um, we, we set out to be what we call outlaw industrial rock, and it has a very Southern, um, Midwestern feel to it. And we've incorporated that over um, all of our albums. So it really takes hold on this one. Yeah, so like it, it's almost basically like a dark progression is almost basically a progression of your sound and the most upfront with it in a way. Like it is sort of like a what you see is what you get scenario. Oh, absolutely. That's why we called it that. We felt that um, with our debut back in 2017, we felt that we were trying to emulate the bands we love. You know, My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult, KMFDM, Ministry. Um, that type of stuff. And we didn't really know who we were yet. And then I think on Wretched Things, we started to hone in on our sound. And I think on Dark Progression, it is just, it's Chemical Straight Jacket. Yeah, well, I, when I first heard Chemical Straight Jacket, the first thing I thought of was mine is a terrible thing to taste. So, like, I... I, I... All time. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is. It's actually my favorite album in history. Yeah, I mean... That... Um, I remember... 17 years old and driving around and blasting that and uh, it changed my life. So yeah, I, I appreciate that. I remember coming out when I was like negative six or something like that. Good times. Good times. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. What's funny is like, what when it came to you know dark progression the new album or just for any album in general with chemical straight jacket does it always start off with a preconceived idea since you have a clear notion of what your sound is or is there still like a lot of experimentation or trial and error involved? I would say that this album probably had the most experimentation. Um, we did a lot of just getting together and riffing and seeing where it went, and then I would program it out into a song. Um, yeah, it, uh, the first, the debut, was very preconceived. It was me sitting in my laundry room and you know playing the notes and writing the songs and then bringing them to the band. But this one is, is much more a band effort. It's much more organic. It's a, a lot of what we've experienced, you know, we experimented with live and that's kind of what become this album it's it's us yeah so the best thing about dark progression is if people are just getting on board with chemical straight jacket this is the album you would recommend them to start off with uh absolutely absolutely i do like the others um funny story when wretched things came out we um we had a release party you remember those when people could get together and <laughs> enjoy each other's company back in my day we had a release party in uh 2019 for wretched things and um there was a guy there that was interviewing us and um he said you know what do you love most about wretched things and i said the next album mm -hmm. because i had already written six or seven songs for this for dark progression i already knew it was you know um a different level and of course the band was pissed because you never diss your new album but I knew this was the one. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, by having like sort of like, because I, I thought that even though you have like a sound that kind of defines you, this outlaw industrial style, like I feel like your music is relatively experimental by bringing in all these different elements. So would you say trying new things is almost kind of like a, a way of life for Chemical Straight Jacket in a way? Absolutely. I, I think that's a brilliant observation. I got to give you kudos for that because on this album, we had so many outsiders come in. Like when we were writing Texas, I was like, you know, Mike's a great guitarist. He's my co-writer. I love him, but he doesn't play slide guitar. So I found somebody who played slide guitar and you hear all those little, just those little accents of, you know, this guy, um, you know, ripping the slide guitar. And then I had another uh, a vocalist who is a local guy. He, he does like um, Judas Priest cover bands. And I was like, you know what? There's a couple songs where we need a higher than I can go. And we blended him into the background. So we, we threw a ton of shit out the wall and just saw what worked and what stuck. And um, if you actually get the CD, 
Mm -hmm. um, it's got a whole page of co-conspirators, and it's massive. Oh, wow. So we just brought in everybody. So th that's what, how you can almost describe Kevin Gold Straightjacket. It's like an ultimate collaborative effort, if you will. I, I've always wanted that, and I think we achieved it on this album, yes. Do you think, you know, you have, you know, this outlaw vibe behind it, you have this old school industrial vibe, could you see maybe other, like, sort of vibes coming into Chemical Straight Jack in the future, maybe, uh, it may sound like a stupid idea, but consider, like, maybe bring sort of, like, a more, uh, hipster vibe to it, or a more, like, a classical vibe to it, or, like, could you, could you see bringing many different cultures and many different elements in the future? I do think that we will continually evolve and continually have an open mind because we're already talking about having more of an Americana sound for the next album, uh, some jangly acoustic guitars and that type of stuff. So yeah, it's it's going to continue to get stranger. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a time with, you know, can there ever be a time where maybe like concepts or maybe like a lyric, the lyrics themselves or something could influence the sound itself? Or has music always needed to be laid down before you had like lyrical ideas or even subject matters you wanted to address? That's a great question. We actually, uh, we work in both directions. Sometimes Mike, the guitarist, will come over and he is laying down riffs and I'm like, oh, wow, I wrote lyrics two weeks ago that fit this perfectly. And we just start, you know, building the song from there. Sometimes I have a very rigid idea for a song because I already, I already programmed it, wrote the lyrics, and I'm like, okay, band, write to this. So it, it's it's really a mishmash um, as far as the creative process for sure. Has there ever been a time where you had like the best lyrics ever, but then they're always like one syllable over or under every arrangement, and that has got to fuck everything <laughs> up, right? Well, no. What happens is if that happens, I tell everybody else to rewrite to match my vocal oh wow they have to adjust to you <laughs> yeah Th those are some um, fighting that's words a couple times. actually we were in the studio and we were recording a song called harpy that's on the new album and mike was like wow you chopped my guitar parts up and placed them in a way that i don't think i could possibly play them and i said okay well take 15 or 20 minutes and we'll play them <laughs> and he did he, he's just that good he could um but uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a talented group of people around me, and I usually get the strange ideas, and they accommodate me, so it works out really well. Yeah. Do you, and is the music, would you say, open to interpretation, or do you try to maybe engage the listener into what the subject matter can be about? Um, I, I would say that differs from song to song. I mean, we have a song called Capesius, which is about this awful human being who, uh, he was the pharmacist at Auschwitz. And he would actually mass murder people. Um, and it, it's, it's a very deep song because I, I read the book about him and it disturbed me so much I wanted to write a song about it. So, of course, it has a break beat and the, the music is very upbeat. And, and then when you listen to the lyrics, oh my God, it's so terrible. Um, but there are other songs where the vibe just, um, by the guys feeding off each other, the vibe takes uh, hold. And we don't ever say that needed to sound more metal that needed to sound more punk it's just you know whatever comes out is what comes out okay so you kind of had the best of both worlds in that regard i would say so yeah. yes and you you know you by having you know elements of literature that you incorporate in your lyrics it's fair to say you also take inspiration from multiple sources as well right oh absolutely yeah when, when it's time to write i read like a fiend i do, I do a lot of reading um and i'll just see something that kind of rubs me and that I just grab onto it and I'll uh, do some research. Um, you know, I'll, I'll read biographies and et cetera. Um, like on um, Wretched Things, we have a, a song about Sam Peckinpah, who is uh, one of my favorite filmmakers from back in the late 60s, early 70s. He made a lot of westerns. And he was a bastard. You know, he would actually hit his actors if they screwed up. A really, really talented guy, but also a really twisted guy. So I'll find inspiration in people like that. And then I dive into it, and then that becomes a song. Yeah, it's amazing when you see like on how much talent, like Caravaggio, who's one of my favorite painters of all time. Like that guy was a murderer, like pretty right. much. He, he like murdered somebody on the. I guess it would be modern day tennis, but at the time it was called squash, where like they basically just mutilated somebody over like a score dispute, and then he would like get he drunk and whip people with a Roman short sword in an alleyway. Yeah, I find people like that to be fascinating, and um, a lot of times, actually on Wretched Things, I had a few people that interviewed us that said, wow, you're very misogynistic, 
And I was like, oh, I'm not misogynistic. I'm just recapping what actually happened in the past. And actually, if you listen to a song like Love, you know, it's uh, it's millions of men dying in war. So it, it's not just, um, you know, I, I just go wherever it takes me and I don't give a shit. You have, do you have to, in a way, like do, when you pick like a subject matter to sing about, does it partially resonate with you though, in a way? Like it has to resonate with you somehow, right? It's not like you're just picking a headline or picking a piece, being like, oh, that'll make a good song. No, it has to. Um, I have to dive into it and be in that mode for days. Um, I'll be walking into work and I will stop before I get in the building and I will take my phone out and I'll mouth lyrics into it as it's hitting me. Um, I do that regularly. Actually, my phone is just full of that. Um, yeah, no, I have to really be into the topic. I got to just do something that somebody else wrote. Yeah, I interviewed a, a back in the fall a band called Macabre, and you know, like every song they sing about is like a different terrible human being like they'll have a song about john wayne gacy and a song about ted bundy and then a song about jim jones and then you know they'll tech a dictator here and there so but like i i asked like you know and it's kind of like at this point kind of stupid for a journalist to ask it but i was always curious like does it have to do they resonate with you and that's why you incorporate it in your art do, do were you personally affected by it i was curious to you know what is it about this that make that makes you want to put it in an extension of yourself, you know, which is your art. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, for me, I have to be into it. A lot of my songs come to me when I'm riding my motorcycle and I just, I get a rhythm in my head and an idea and I'll just pull over, you know, I tell my wife, pull over, I'm signaling in the mirror, you know, and I pull out the phone and just start riffing into the phone. And then when I get back, I start writing and that's a new song. I bet your so, wife was um, thrilled. <laughs> um, she's supportive uh, she's incredible she's she's part of the live show you know she's on stage she runs the lights and the smoke and she does backing vocals actually if you watch our new video uh, for destroyer that's her and she does a great job All so she's been which helps that's something that, from what you've been telling me that's something i really find unique about chemical straitjacket it really is sort of like not just a band but it is like an idea in which so many people could come and contribute to and bring their own elements into it and i think that's got to keep it interesting for you and interesting for your listeners at the same time i i, I hope that comes through um, obviously it did for you but uh yeah that's always been important to me that you know, uh, okay, so we're going to write a song about Texas. What do we need to do? Well, let's bring in, you know, we actually had a mechanic come over and he plays an air compressor along with the bass drum. Um, he, uh, he plays ratchets and yeah, I sample him and then drop it into the song. So there's a million just, it's, it's like all these crazy ideas and we just do them. And then we delete what doesn't work and we keep what does work. And everybody's welcome to uh, have a part in a chemical straight jacket song for sure. You know uh, who you kind of remind me of? Uh, the new industrial artist Arthur and Punisher, who I've uh, interviewed uh, back a couple years ago. Oh my God. Awesome. That live show is like, that bass is like, your ribs are just like vibrating when you're watching them play live. They're a great band, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I would say I probably model myself or our band most after um, the early Wax Tracks days when Al Jorgensen just had an open revolving door and he would do an album with Ian McKay from Fugazi. Well, back then he would have been from Minor Threat. Um, he would do an album, you know, anybody. And he would actually even give up lead vocals, say, hey, you do the vocals on this one. It was just this big collaborative project that just put out so much great stuff. That's what I've always kind of modeled this after. Well, I see a lot of errors of industrial in Chemical Straightjacket. Like one minute, I, like I'm thinking, I'm thinking mine is a terrible thing to taste, and then I'm thinking of, uh, then I'm thinking of Pretty Hate Machine, and then you know maybe there's some stuff that I even see reminiscing back to Throbbing Gristle. So like I okay. think, so I I do think that you cover like multiple eras of industrial. Is there like a particular era of industrial? Like you mentioned the Wax Tracks days and all that, but like with some new school industrial bands like Three Teeth or Arthur and Punisher, like have you been noticing that industrial is still alive and well at the same time? It is, and I love bands like Three Teeth. I love Arthur and Punisher because they're actually writing songs. What I don't like is um, just to um, get a laptop and make some bleeps and blips and stuff. Like I, I like actual song structure. I like these guys who are, you know, I think that what we do harkens back to that day where you're actually writing a rock song, but you're doing it on digital medium and you're using experimentation and you're making it interesting. 
um, because you're not just using a regular band, you know, you know sample breaking glass and all that type of stuff. Um, that's what I always loved. So that's always been my goal. I always wanted to write basically rock songs, but do them in an industrial way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, and that's where sort of like the outlaw thing comes in because, I mean, you know, having that sort of like outlaw country vibe, I mean, that's as raw and down and dirty as it gets and no fucking computer could emulate something that because I feel like the the attitude is just as much as part of the instrumentation. I would agree with that completely. And we also called it outlaw industrial because it really doesn't fit in. It's hard to find our niche. Um, What we're doing, there's not a lot of people doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it is very digital, and and I love that stuff. Don't get me wrong; I'm not knocking it in any way. It's good stuff, but it's just not what we're doing. You know, we're we're doing rock and roll, but uh, with programming and sequencing and sampling and that type of stuff. Yeah, and maybe you could even go heavier to something like Demanufacture or Wisconsin Death Trip era, something like that, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's great stuff. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, you know, that that's all my wheelhouse for sure, and that's where, where the the background that this band is coming from. Absolutely. Oh, so Fear Factory fans. Oh, absolutely. I mean, our producer is John Bechtel, who is the keyboardist in Ministry, and he was the keyboardist in Fear Factory uh, for quite a while. He was in Killing Joke. Um, he's a just a really talented fellow who really. Um, he took my ideas and, and vision and lack of <laughs> ability and really um, embraced it. And he's become a great friend. Um, so we're, we, you know, we, yeah, absolutely. I mean, great guy. You know? um, so yeah, there's a lot of ministry and killing joke in our music, absolutely, because our producer is from ministry and killing joke. One thing I've noticed about industrial music is that. One thing that's been consistent, even though the sound has evolved so much over the years, like I've always noticed on stage persona is just as important as the music in itself. And when you look at how Al Jurgensen or Trent Reznor or, you know, Marilyn Manson, even I'm going to throw him in the mix as well, like portray themselves on stage. And you're seeing it now with bands like Ghost or not Ghost, as everybody confuses them as, but Ghost or even Arthur and Punisher. Do you almost feel like maybe with you as well as other fellow industrial artists that maybe on stage and in the music you kind of portray a character in a way oh absolutely 100 percent. i um i said when this first started and it started gaining momentum if i'm going to get on stage i have to be some someone like other than myself you know i have to bring a show i grew up on kiss i mean to me the show is very important so when we would first play we would bring in projectors and you know, it would take me 45 minutes to set up screens and you know smoke machines. We've actually been thrown out of a few places because we over smoked the place, and uh, you know the fire alarms go off. Um, but to me, the show is as important. Actually, live, I think the show is more important than the oh, songs. Definitely, I think you have to grab someone's attention, and then later they'll appreciate the songs. But live is is all about bringing uh, bringing an energy and. You know, Nick Cave is probably my favorite uh, frontman of all time. And, you know, the, the times that I've seen him and that he points at me and taunts me, I mean, that's priceless. So that's kind of what I do. Yeah, out smoking the place. You know the band Sun? It's spelled Sun O in a way. Or... I think so. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're not industrial, but they played at a club, a 250-cap uh, club in Brooklyn, and uh, they were using two fog machines that you use in a stadium. And yes, I couldn't even order from the bar. Like, uh, it, it just like I was like, where is it? Like, you could not see two feet in front of you. If I put my hand in front of my face, I couldn't see it. That's awesome. That was our very first show. I actually, I was like, we need a smoke machine. So I bought the Fog Fury Three Thousand, <laughs> which is like giant stadium material, and we brought it to a little club. And oh my, you know what though? For our first show, I was so nervous. It was great. I couldn't see anything. So I was playing to a sea of smoke, and it was very comfortable doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, yeah. Uh, th- th- you'll definitely be remembered one way or another in that regard. <laughs> right. Yep. And and going yeah. and going back to the character persona, do you feel like you're almost in the album and on stage you're completely escaping yourself, like you're portraying somebody very different, or is it kind of like maybe just an extension or an alias of who you are personally? 
That's a great question. I would call it an extension. I think that when I'm on stage and when we're recording and when we're writing, I think I am me without inhibitions. I'm me who's not working in the pharmacy and, you know, giving injections and filling prescriptions. I have no boundaries. I can just be the raw character that I've always wanted to be. And I think that that's what I am in the band, actually. Yeah. So it's almost, I do think people who may know you personally, but never seen you live, they'd be quite shocked when they see you to see that it's the same person. And all the time, actually just yesterday, I had someone say to me, you have two different lives. I saw your video on YouTube mm-hmm. and I was working at the pharmacy and I was like, okay, shh, that's cool. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 the two worlds have never clashed. So, so far, so good. That and and that's I think really cool. Maybe maybe you could maybe you could uh, use pharmaceuticals as merch. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that would sell. That would definitely sell. <laughs> maybe we need to, pants need to make money nowadays. So maybe 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 you and I thought of something. We'll talk when I log off. <laughs> we'll talk when it's off. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, and just uh, finally, before I go, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, is there just anything else that you would like to promote, like uh, with the release of Dark Progression and uh, just maybe some new singles, uh, maybe a live stream performance here and there as well? We did do um, – I'm not into live streaming. We've always been resistant to it. Um, I love to feed off of people. Um even if it's just 10 people or, you know, we've really played to 400, but I like to feed off people and live streaming has always been not my thing, but we did do it on New Year's Eve. We did a live stream concert and I think it's excellent and it really showcases the new songs from Dark Progression. So if you want to hit YouTube and check out our own one and only, I'm not doing it again, live stream, um, I, th- I think it uh, really captures the band and, uh, and came too great. Yeah. And when you uh, and when live music does return after this whole bullshit is over, please come to New York one day. We we love the industrial scene. We need to see. We need you to come to New York. Uh, we'll be there. We've uh, we played the Knitting Factory. We played uh, mostly Brooklyn places. Uh, not so much Manhattan yet, but yeah, oh, we'll be there absolutely. Yeah. yeah uh, when did you play Knitting Factory last? Uh, we were direct support for My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult. When would that have been? Shit. Probably two years ago. Okay. You know? Yeah. I mean, um, before before the pandemic, there was always like 17 shows in a night, and you have to try to be at all of them, so. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, you, you've got plenty of stimulation there, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. We'll be back. We'll, we'll be back. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Everybody, we are here with Kevin of Chemical Straight Jacket. Be sure to check out Dark Progression when it comes out. Check out the new single, Texas. This is Alex from Heavy New York.